morning, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you special moms out there. I hope you guys are going to take some time today to spend time with your family, um, spend time with your wives and with your moms and maybe your, your grandmoms or, or whatever, but I hope you have something special planned because it's your responsibility today. Moms, I hope you're relaxed. I hope you get your feet rubbed, your back rubbed. Uh, I hope you get food served to you. I hope you're treated like the queen of the universe today. And if you're not, then just talk to the elders and we'll see what we can do, okay? <laughs> We're starting a new series about uh, a journey. And last uh, sermon series, we were talking about our mission statement, which is who we're going to be as a church, uh, what defines us. And this sermon series, we're going to be talking about where we are going. I don't know about you, but the idea of taking a journey is exciting to me. Um, journey, the idea of taking a journey is not only exciting, but um, it can be fun, it can be challenging. Um, and arguably, the most exciting part, part about the journey is what you get to take pictures of. You see everything, and you're taking pictures of it, especially in our digital age. You have your iPhones that can take really awesome pictures of anything that you want to. But unfortunately, sometimes you can, get, you can get so lost in taking pictures that you actually forget to enjoy the moment. You know what I mean? It's like Angel and I with Piper. Like, I'm sitting there enjoying the moment, and he's just like, move, get out of the way. I want to take a picture of this. And then she literally, if you look on her phone, 2,000 pictures of Piper already. And it's only been four months. It's incredibly ridiculous. I've got like three. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's a good picture. Anyways, so... The Hobbit, right? The Hobbit's one of my favorite movies. Um, the, Hobbit, the first one is An Unexpected Journey. And Bilbo, he's going on an adventure with dwarves. If you've never read The Hobbit, if you've never read Lord of the Rings, I highly encourage you. One of my favorite series of all time. But he starts this journey. He's climbing mountains. He's going to different cities. He's seeing different peoples. He's going in different structures. And he's seeing the wonders of his world. But he also sees dreadful things. He sees death and disease and evil and goblins and orcs. It's, it's fantastic. You have to see the movie. You have to read the book. The Unexpected Journey. And that's kind of what we're on. We all are on a journey, and not many of us really know what to expect. I know that Angel and I, when we first got together, we've been married for over seven years, and when we first got together, we wanted to travel. Right? We had a lot of dreams about traveling. We wanted to first see the United States. Um, we wanted to see the Grand Canyon. She already has, but I haven't. We wanted to see Mount Rushmore. We want to go to Hawaii. Um, I would like to see the West Coast, maybe drive up and down the West Coast. I'd love to travel to London to see Harry Potter World. I'd love to go to New Zealand to see the Hobbit World. Um, I think it would be really fun to go to the Mediterranean and sail the Mediterranean, see all the biblical places where Jesus was in Israel, um, but also where Paul stopped along his journeys. And I would totally see the pyramids. I don't know about what you guys would do if you could take the journey of your dreams, but those are some of the things that I would do. Angel and I, we never took a honeymoon, and so maybe one of these days we'll be able to trust somebody to watch Piper, and we'll go see one of these things, but I think it would be super fun to go on a journey for like 12 days and just explore a place that I have never seen before. We, on this journey, get to see things that we have never seen before. We get to see life change. We get to see states change and nations change. We get to see people change. And what's really cool about this is that along the way, we ourselves, we get to change as well. Um, and so that's, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. I've got a picture up here for you. This picture is of, scientists have calculated this would be the perfect road trip to take in the United States right? The perfect road trip. Um, so you have point A where you start and you travel all over the United States, down around to Texas, and then back up to the East Coast would be the perfect road trip. You can get this picture online really easy in case uh, you decide that you want to do something crazy and do this. Probably would take you a really long time to do. So if you have spare time and spare cash, I would suggest doing this. But I think this is cool. I think this is cool. Um, I, wouldn't, I would be lying to you if I were to tell you that there wasn't some regret about not taking those trips and those journeys before Angel and I kind of made life a little bit more serious. But life has presented to us a lot of beautiful things, a lot of wonderful things, that if we would have taken those journeys, maybe it wouldn't have led us to where we are today. Um, here at Severn Christian Church, with our beautiful daughter Piper, with our loving family. And so God just works things out for his good. And as we go along this journey, I want to encourage you 
that just like the Hobbit, there's going to be beautiful things and there's going to be challenging things. Just like your own personal journey, there are going to be regrets, but there's also going to be blessings from God. And these next six sermons are really going to deal with kind of the six main functions of where we're going to go as a church. So I'm going to pray for this message. Um, I hope that you pray for me, that I can deliver it in such a way that it would articulate who we are and what we want to be, and that you would be an encouraged and convicted to join this journey with us. So will you join me in prayer? God, we want to thank you, Lord, for giving us your son, uh, providing a way that we can come back to you. God, um, all of us here at one time were either lost or are currently lost, wandering in the desert, Lord. Uh, in a dry and, and weary land, but you saved us, you've reached out to us to bring us on a wonderful journey with you. God, I pray that we will be willing to um, take that journey with you, to take a step uh, to see the, the world, Lord, through your eyes, to see our families through your eyes, to see Severn Christian Church through your eyes. And Lord, as we go on the journey of seeing, God, I pray that you would speak to us through your word and that we would be the people that you want us to be. Thank you for the moms, Lord. Thank you for the moms who have sacrificed and who have given. God, I pray a special blessing and prayer on them today that their, their joy would be made complete in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 17, that's where we're going to start out. We are going to be going through um, some various passages of Scripture this morning, and so I encourage you to open up your Bible and come right along with us as we go through. But here in this passage of Scripture, um, Jesus is taking a mini journey with his three favorite people, Peter, James, and John. A lot of us, we do need to have really close friendships. Um, you know, it is okay to have cliques, I guess you could say, in the church, as long as they are inclusive and not exclusive. It's okay to have an intimate group of friends that you fellowship with, as long as if somebody else wants to join that group, you welcome them in and not say, no, you're not allowed to be a part of our special group. Even Jesus had a clique. It was Peter, James, and John, and then he had the apostles, which were 12 men, included Peter, James, and John, um, and Jesus had other groups of people that he impacted. But here's what's interesting. He's taking a journey with Peter, James, and John, and he's climbing up a mountain. Are there any mountain climbers here? Anybody like to climb mountains? Okay, so we have a room full of sane, intelligent people. That is good to know, right? I don't know about you guys, but the people who climb rocks without any rope, at least, are absolutely, verifiably insane. I mean, I would never do that. Um, but Jesus is climbing what could be considered a mountain. And what's cool about a mountain is you have your mountain peak, of course, but you also have hills that are part of the mountain, right? So sometimes you actually have to walk up over a hill and down a valley in order to get to the mountaintop. Sometimes you have to walk up two or three of those in order to get to the mountaintop. So we're probably talking about here with Jesus. He was at the base of, of a mountain. And so look what it says here in chapter 17 of Matthew, verse 1. It says, six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. And as the men watched, Jesus' appearance transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. So they saw Jesus, the Greek word here, to envision, to see Jesus. And the transfiguration is actually where we get our word metamorphosis. It's metamorpho in the Greek, and it is a transfiguration that actually took place of his appearance. And it says in verse 3, suddenly... Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It's really interesting that Peter is able to recognize these two people who have been dead for over 1,000 years, arguably maybe 1,200 to, to 1,300 years um, at this time, and instantly he's able to, to recognize them. So I don't know if they had an actual body or if their spirit actually kind of conformed to what their body would have looked like. We're not really sure, but what we do know is he immediately recognized him. And this is what is so funny, because it is so typical of man, that any time there's any form of a spiritual revival, you've got Peter saying, let's build something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like churches, for instance, uh, you have the cathedral age. Anytime they're like excited about doing something for God, they're like, you know what we could do? We could build a gigantic structure that looks beautiful. And people have done that all through the ages. It's like, um, it's like Star Wars, right? Hmm, I wonder what the next movie is going to be about. Let's see, movie number one was a giant Death Star who was going to destroy the universe and take it over, and then they destroyed it. Number two was a giant Death Star who was going to destroy the universe, and, and, and so they took it over. 
Number three, if you haven't seen the Star Wars movie, sorry, it's already out on DVD, but I'll give you a hint. There's a giant Death Star, and it's going to destroy the universe. I wonder what the next movies are going to be about. I'm willing to take a guess. <laughs> and it's so predictable, because this is what the, the apostles do. This is what people of God will do. Um, whenever there's a spiritual revival, they're like, we need to build a building. Right? And so it's so typical of Peter here. And so G look what Jesus says. He says in verse 5, But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified, and they fell face down to the ground. You see, the reason why God selected Moses and Elijah to be present here is because Moses represented the law, right? The first five books of the Old Testament. And Elijah represented the prophets, all the rest of, of the Old Testament written by prophets. And what God is saying here is he's saying, Peter, you've been a Jew for your whole life. You've listened to the law and the prophets. Now, now, I want you to listen to my son. He's going to fulfill the law, and he's going to give you something new that you can focus on, something new that you're going to give your life for. And look at verse, uh, verse 7, and it says, um, Jesus came over and touched them, and he said, get up. Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they only saw Jesus. And they went back down the mountain, and Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So the first point that we're going to talk about this morning is this idea of vision. And be patient with me because I want to make some clarifications as we approach this vision series about what we are saying and what we aren't saying. The idea of a vision is to behold. It comes from the Greek word edu. Uh, vision in scripture simply meant this, seeing with a spiritual mind. It could also be taken as what is seen in the spirit and brings a needed action in the physical reality. Tapping into another frequency, another reality, to have divine sight. And God has spoken to various people from the foundation of the world all through up to his son Jesus. He has spoken to them in dreams when they're asleep. He has presented himself um, before them either in Messiah Jesus or in a burning bush or in a cloud that God has given them a, a sight to see in a physical reality. Sometimes God has spoken to them um, through some form of an audible voice. And God has spoken to his prophets and his people in various ways throughout the course of history. And it's important for us to understand this because if God is going to speak to them that way, does that mean that that's how God speaks to us? In other words, as we're determining what the vision is for our personal lives, for Severn Christian Church, and for our role in the greater scheme of the kingdom, is God going to come down and speak to me in a burning bush? Is God going to give me a dream and tell me, Rick Bonifield, this is what I want you to do? And I want you to think about that for a moment. But it's important because God wanted, in this mountaintop experience, God wanted his disciples to see Jesus as he truly was. You know, I was listening to a radio show, and uh, a lady had called in, and she was talking about how God told her something. Um, she said, you know, God t told me to tell my husband this. And the radio host, without missing a beat, said, yeah, what did his voice sound like? And then just let it hang. And she was like, uh, 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 well, uh, he goes, well, what I'm trying to say is, is that you're saying that God spoke to you, and I want to know what his voice sounds like. And she couldn't really give him an answer. And why this is important is because he's he wanted to tell her, and he did. He said that God doesn't speak to us in the way that you think he speaks to you. Whether you have this feeling on your heart, or you have this sudden conviction, or this emotional excitement about something, that's not how God speaks to us today. Now, God could certainly visit us in a dream. God could certainly come down and speak to us in a voice. But is it probable that he would do that? Would God actually do that now today? Certainly he could, but our answer is no. And I have some scriptures that I want to show you. Now this is what's important, that as we look at God's word, we have to be responsible and we have to be reasonable when we ask, what is it that God wants us to do? For instance, think about your personal life. Has there ever been a decision where you didn't know which way to go, you didn't know which option to choose, and so you started seeking after God? God, what is it that you want me to do in this situation? Maybe it was before you got married. Maybe it was a job selection. Maybe it's about where you should live or where you should retire. Um, there are a lot of different things that we can seek the Lord's will over. And a lot of people are confused because they think, well, God is going to speak to me by giving me a feeling. Or God is going to speak to me by um, coming down and, and telling me in a dream. 
or I'll have this sudden illumination of God's will for my life, and that just simply isn't true. I would like for you to read um, Hebrews chapter 1 with me, so if you will turn there. When we approach the scripture, I want you to think of it like this. Be a journalist. Be a journalist, right? A good journalist will discover the who, who is he speaking to, and who is speaking. The what, what is he telling them? The where, where is he telling them from? For instance, where is Paul writing from? And where is he writing to? When is this being written? Was this written today or was this written 2,000 years ago? Who, what, when, where, and finally why? Why is God putting this in his scripture? Why is God writing this? So when we approach the New Testament, when we approach our vision, when we approach God's will for our life, we need to go back to the word, and this is why. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says this. Long ago, God spoke many times and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. We discussed that. Verse 2, and now in these final days, he has spoken through his son. Past tense. That God used to operate and speak to people in various ways, but now, in these final days, God has spoken through his son. Past tense. How does God speak to us today? He speaks to us through his son. Where can we find the words of his son? We find it in the word of God. Another scripture. Turn to Jude. Uh, Jude only has one chapter, but um, for easy reference, Jude chapter 1 verse 3. And look at what this passage of scripture has to say. What I like to do too is next to the Hebrews verse, if you like to write in your Bible, it's totally okay. I like to write these scriptures next to each other so that whenever I'm doing a Bible study with someone or personal devotion or defending the faith, I can cross-reference scriptures. Look what it says in Jude chapter 1 verse 3. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you to appeal that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Once for all. This is why it's important. There are people out today that are claiming new divine inspiration from God. If I were to stand up on this stage and I were to tell you that God spoke to me and told me that this is what Severn Christian Church should do, you should point to these scriptures and say, no, Rick, God has spoken. What you're telling me is not true. It is not from God. It is from your own mind. The reason why this is important is because you have a lot of people that, let's say, for instance, the false prophet Muhammad who said, I have a continued revelation from Jesus the Christ, right, from the Jews and from, the, and from Christianity. I am now God's spoken prophet, and he went to invent the religion of Islam and literally changed the world because he claimed to have spoken um, with God and that God gave him this message. But no, Muhammad, God has spoken. You've got the Jehovah's Witnesses with Charles T. Russell, um, who began this movement claiming divine inspiration. And when he was held in a court of law, the man could not even speak Greek or Hebrew, couldn't read it, couldn't even say the alphabet. But yet this man is claiming divine inspiration. You have Joseph Smith with the Latter-day Saints, a new revelation. You've got the papacy who says you cannot understand the word of God unless it's through us. And they have new laws and new teachings that have come down through the ages. You've got the Holy, Holiness Pentecostal churches who do believe a new revelation does come to them from the Lord. You've got TV evangelists, and this is probably the most relevant for you, who will tell you that God is speaking through him to you as you watch the TV. And this is so funny because they just, you can just tell when they're on TV and they close their eyes and they're like, I can feel the Lord telling me that someone out there has ear to bowel syndrome and that if you'll just donate to this prophet at 1-800-333-GIVE, then God will send you healing. And I'm like, you are telling a lie. You have no clue what anybody out there is struggling with. And if you have a million TV audience, you know, I imagine one of those people might have something that you listed off and is like, oh, he's speaking to me. Why it's so important to understand this is because as we move forward in a vision, we want to stick with the scriptures. We want to build where this church is going to go, who this church is going to be, off of the written word of God. Your life, your, your plan that you have that is intertwined with God's plan, you need to base that off of the scriptures. Your, job, uh, your jobs, your future, your children, your family decisions should not come through how you feel. It should come through what does God's word say. So the key phrase is simply this. 
that God speaks to us through the words of the apostles and the prophets, and this is the Bible. This is the Bible, the written word of God. What is the vision for this church? Well, let's get back to the Bible. Let's see what the New Testament has to say. What is God telling us through the written words of the apostles? Look at 1 Thessalonians up on the screen for you. Um, Chapter 2, verse 13, uh, B, Paul writes this, You didn't think of our words as mere human ideas, but you accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is, and this word continues to work in those who believe. The reference is up there, not necessarily uh, just the scripture. Right? This is the word of God. This is how you're accepting it. In John chapter 16, now this is a very important one, because this one is misused a lot. And like I said, be patient with me, because I'm building upon a foundation to clarify what I am talking about and what I'm not talking about. In John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8, Jesus is telling who? His disciples. Right? He's telling his disciples this. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, a lot of people will take this passage of Scripture and say, see, the Holy Spirit convicts us of these personal things. How does he convict us, is the question. How does he convict us, is the question. Through an emotional feeling? through a circumstance or a situation? Absolutely not. The word helper, this is so cool, the word helper actually means script writer. In the first century, when they would go to court, a lot of people couldn't afford an attorney, or if you actually, if you hired an attorney, it was almost an admission of guilt. And so what they would do as a script writer is they would pay someone who understood the law, who understood the times, to write out a defense for them. And so they would take this script and they would stand before the judge and they would literally read their defense of why they are not guilty um, for the crime that they were being accused of. And that's what Jesus is telling the apostles. It's going to be better for you if I go because the script writer is going to come and he's going to be able to help you tell the world about righteousness, about judgment, and about sin. And so when we answer the question, How does God convict us regarding the vision and the future for Severn Christian Church? We must unwaveringly say, what does the Word of God say? Not how we think, not how we feel, not what we want, but what does God's Word say? So the key phrase to end this first point is simply this. The Holy Spirit will convict non-Christians today through sharing the Word of God, through sharing the Bible. Your friends, your family, your, your uh, schoolmates, the people that you work with, your co-workers, will never be convicted by God, will never have a life change unless you share this message with them. Unless the word of God is spoken, true conviction cannot happen. And this is why it's so important for us as a vision for our church, as a, our personal journey, is that so often we can look in all these different avenues and ways to get a word from the Lord when we should be opening up the word of God and saying, God, what is it that you're trying to tell me? Let me read about this. Let me study this. Let me understand this. Speak to me today through your word, Lord. Speak to us as a church through your word. What is it that you want us to do? I want you to think about it like this. I want you to think about it that it's like an enlightened state of mind for the Christian to start seeing God's redemptive plan for your personal life, for your ministry, and for your eternity. It is the difference between being enlightened and being illuminated. Think about a light bulb, right? The doctrine of illumination basically means this, that before God came into your life, the light bulb was off. And when he came in through his own divine will, he switched the light bulb on and now you can see. The doctrine of illumination is not true. It's absolutely false for a lot of different reasons that we're not going to talk about this morning. Whereas the understanding of enlightenment means this. The light bulb has always been on. It just is a little dim. And when you came to Jesus and you were baptized into Jesus' name, that the light bulb suddenly became bright and you have a new perspective in the way that you view the world. Situations, circumstances, understanding is now totally different. It's enlightened. It has a new perspective because now God is in the scene. You begin to understand situations and seeing things differently than you, than you did before. This is what Dr. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Jack Cottrell, Dr. That's going to be the new quick word for doctor, okay? 
Dr. Jack Cottrell, very uh, important and prominent theologian in our brotherhood, has taught at uh, the university for many, many years. This is what he says. He says, this does not mean that we receive no help from God in our effort to understand Scripture. God will not answer our prayers by directly feeding knowledge into our minds, but by providing us with the means to achieve this knowledge through personal study. To achieve this knowledge through personal study. He will sharpen our mental process. He will clear our preoccupied minds. He will prevent distractions. He will help us concentrate. And he will help us to recall ideas, to put ideas together. He says, James chapter 1, verse 5, which says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him pray. He says, James chapter 1, verse 5, instructs us to pray for wisdom. This is not a prayer for new knowledge, but for discernment and how to use and apply what is already known. Right? God, help remove my distractions. God, help remove my wants, my desires. Let me see your plan for my life, for this church, for this world. What is it that you want, God? And that's how we're going to build. So this is why I say this, that when I give you this vision, I'm not giving it to you from the Lord, right? I'm giving it to you from Rick Bonifield's little, weak, feeble mind to the best of my human possibility. I have to study just as hard as the next person. You have to study just as hard as the next person if you want to find out what is the will of the Lord. What is God's plan for my life? What is it that he wants me to do? What does God want this church to do? And so, with the time remaining, we are going to touch on three brief points about God's vision for this church, right? And this vision that we have crafted, that we have presented, there are other copies available. If you, were not, if you couldn't make it to the vision meeting last Sunday, that's totally okay. There are copies available that we can give to you. Just come to one of the elders or myself and say, I would like to have a copy. Or send us an email and we can give you a digital copy. But Severn Christian Church is what we call a non-denominational, independent, restoration Christian church. What we mean by that is we want to restore what the first century Christians did. That's simply what we want to do. There are certain things that we cling on to, certain value statements that we have, such as no book but the Bible. While other books are good and beneficial and intelligent, we will cling on to no other book but the Bible, the Word of God, um, as our final rule of faith and authority. No creed but Christ. There are a lot of different creeds that we should uh, maybe understand and know and cling to, but no creed but Christ. We're only going to hold on to who Jesus was and what he said and what he revealed in his word is a very important thing to come along to because if somebody comes down and gives you a creed, a formulatic statement, that's not God's word. That's, that's a man-made invention. The Bible is our final rule of faith and authority. What does the Bible have to say? That's going to be the final rule when we make decisions. There's another really cool phrase that goes like this. Do all things in Bible ways, calling Bible things by Bible names. Elders are elders. Evangelists are evangelists. Deacons are deacons. We need to uphold the word of God and the language that it used so that we can properly understand what the Lord's will is. Another value is this. Unity in Christian essentials. Whatever's in the Word of God that we should follow, we should be unified not only as a group of people, but as churches all across the world. So unity in Christian essentials, liberty in non-essentials. This is what's important. Liberty in non-essentials. If somebody likes Christian rap, that doesn't mean they're a sinner because you don't like rap music. If somebody likes a big building, that doesn't make them a sinner because they choose to have church in a big building. If somebody just wants to do house churches, that doesn't mean that that's wrong. If somebody likes the New King James Version, or the NIV Version, or the NLT Version, that doesn't mean that they're wrong. There are a lot of people who believe that the King James Version is the only translation that you should read. That's simply not true. People can do church differently, and we need to have liberty in letting people do church differently. And I'll clarify what I mean by that here in a little bit. But So in unity, Christian essentials, in liberty, non-essentials, but love in all things. What we're getting down to is simply this. Our value as a, as a church, what does the word of God say? What does God's word say? Now, we've been able to kind of craft this into basically two sentences, two statements. We want to accomplish two things, and we believe if we accomplish these two vision statements, then we will be able to be successful as a church and share the word of God and grow the kingdom. The first one is this. Connect with each other and bringing people to Christ. If we can connect as a church body and bring people to know Jesus, we're doing what God wants us to do. 
And number two, to commit to being servants and planning churches in Maryland. That if we are committed to serving each other, to serve people in our community, to show Jesus' love by what we do, and plant churches in Maryland, we will be accomplishing what God wants this church to accomplish. So here's the simple key understanding, is that we want to be the church that we read about in the scriptures. We want to be the church we read about in the scriptures. So here's our second point. There are three hills that I want you to look at, okay? And I want you to view these things not like steps. In other words, once I step from one, I can then move on from this step and go to the other. I want you to view these things as practices, things that we are going to continue to do as a church. What is the vision for Severn Christian Church, right? So you got your mountain. We have trees back here and some roads about this journey series. I want you to picture a mountain with two hills in front of it, right? Two hills in front of it. And so hill number one is this, is the hill of looking in. What is God's vision for our life? What is God's vision for our life? You know, this is a, a very simple process. That as you are growing as an individual Christian, as a person, you are sharing God's message with the local community. But here's the catch. The only true way to grow inwardly as a person belonging to Jesus is to share the message with with your local community. It's a both and. It's not an either or. In other words, you can't really grow spiritually and be the person that God wants you to be if you're not sharing the gospel message with the people that you're around. You see, preparation is part of the journey. I'm an overpacker. Any other overpackers in here? When you, when yes. Okay, if I'm going for three J's, I'm packing seven shirts, right? That's just how it's going to be. Seven shirts, seven pair of underwear, seven pair of socks, because you never know what could happen, right? And so I can have like this huge bag uh, filled with stuff that I absolutely do not need, but, um, but that's what I like to do. I like to overprepare, especially when I think about vision stuff. Like, I always think about, okay, what are all the possibilities that could happen from this outcome? And I will waste so much time thinking about all the possible outcomes that it's like, dude, just focus on what's going on in the here and now and what's within reality. (laughs) I'm like, well, if somebody does this, then I could potentially do that, and then I would respond this way. And I'll do that, and it drives me absolutely insane. But I am a total overpacker, and I like to prepare. I like to be ready. You know, you never know what life's going to throw at you when you uh, go visit Grandma and Grandpa, and so you want to be prepared Yes, when I go visit grandma and grandpa, I do the same thing. It doesn't matter. Going to camp, it doesn't matter. Well, just as a quick joke, uh, it's not a joke, but it is funny. So when we go to camp, I took a gigantic bag, right? It was like a huge suitcase full of stuff. I took a, a- air conditioner. <laughs> they don't have air conditioners in the cabin. It's like torture. I'm like breaking out in hives and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, I'm like, this is the last time I'm coming to this camp. You know what I'm saying? So I brought an air conditioner with me the next time, and I created an incubator around my, uh, around my cabin, or I guess around my bed, and then I fed the air conditioner just inside of my bed. Uh, that way I could stay nice and cool. It was phenomenal. I absolutely loved it. And uh, so I don't know why I told you that, but I just thought it was funny. But hey, look, let's, go, let's keep going here. So here's what we're saying is that the only way that we can share the message of Jesus, the only way that we can make it to hill number two as if we start the climb of hill number one. What is God's vision for you? What is God's vision for your life? It's simply this, to be conformed to the image of his son, to be like Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, we find this very simple statement written by the Apostle Paul. It says this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. What is God's will for your life? It is to be like Jesus. If you look throughout the Bible and you find out, okay, what is God's will? There's actually simple statements that say, this is God's will. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, be conformed or be transformed by the renewal of your mind so you can understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, here's what's interesting. The only way that you can have a transformed mind, the only way you can truly understand what God's will is for your life is for you to let the Holy Spirit come into your life. For you to let God transform you through Christian immersion, then you have that enlightenment. You have the light bulb is now brighter and you start to see things differently. Bad circumstances now become opportunities. Negative aspects of life now become part of the process to make you stronger. The, su- the successful things that take place 
our now glory uh, is given to God. It, it changes your perspective. And there are just some simple things that we're not going to look at, but they are up on the screen. They should be in your bulletin. And so we're looking at how specifically, how specifically should we be like Jesus? And this, these scriptures are so cool. Number one, be a thankful person. Be a thankful person. This is the, the Lord's will. It literally says that. This is God's will. Give thanks. Longing for what you don't have is only going to bring you and those around you misery. Absolutely misery. You're not thankful for what you have. And look at some other things. Sexual purity. Always doing the right thing. Don't lose control of your mind by getting drunk. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Stop getting drunk. Stop getting intoxicated. Stop losing control of your mind. And that's not just talking about with alcohol. You can do that with marijuana. You can do that with pain medication. God wants you to be in control of your mind. That's his will. Number five, be right with God and to know the truth. The Bible says God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In order to fill God's vision for this church, if you're like, man, I really want to help Seven Christian Church accomplish something great, you first have to get your own relationship with God right. It has to be right. And there are two ways that you can make that right. When you fully believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, God calls you to have action. The first word is repentance. I want you to picture the, 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 the two hilltops, right? You've got hill number one, number two, and then the mountaintop. Hill number one is your personal journey. But everyone who is outside of Christ is actually walking towards a desert, a dry and a weary land where there's no hope, there's no happiness, there's no ultimate blessing. There's no ultimate joy. There's no purpose. You're walking towards a dry desert. And what repentance literally means is to do an about face and start walking back this way. It's to do an about face. So when God says, I want you to repent, when the Bible says repent, it means to do a U-turn, to turn away from your sin, to turn away from your sinful choices. God wants you to start walking back towards him. Number two is baptism. That God wants to change you, but that could only happen when you are immersed into Christ and you receive the Holy Spirit. So picture it like this. You're walking towards the desert, right? And you decide to do an about phase, and now you're turning back to the Lord. But before you can start climbing these three hills to ultimately get to eternity, you must go through a running river. And this river is streaming right down from the mountaintop, and it's surrounding the base. And the only way to get to that hill is to first pass through the water. But for those of you who have been thirsty, like I am right now, my mouth is really dry and it's a terrible experience, right? Have you ever been really, really thirsty? Yeah, it's not enjoyable. Um, that way I'm always like popping gum and a mint in my mouth after service because it's like, you know, a dry and deadly land in my mouth rather than weary. But uh, it's true, it's true. So before you can approach these hilltops, you first must be washed. And you can drink cool water that satisfies. And you can be blessed by God. And when you pass through that water, you begin your journey. This is what's cool, is that there is a river that actually is flowing down from the mountaintop. And as you climb, you have access to this water. Water is the substance of life in the scriptures. It provides nourishment and satisfaction. And whenever you can, you can reach down and, and take a drink of water. That's what this, this hill looks like, to be baptized in Jesus' name. Peter put it like this, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you receive two things, forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That this journey that we are on in Maryland will not be successful unless you, as a personal person, is willing to take the climb. Unless we are willing to put our faith in Jesus and be immersed in his name, we will never be able to be who God wants us to be. Our key phrase is this, God gives us the Holy Spirit to become like Jesus as our part to minister to the severed world. To our part of the world is the only way that we can provide change by getting the Holy Spirit involved in our life. You see, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit does not enlighten you in the sense of illumination. It doesn't turn the light bulb on and now you get divine knowledge. The reason why God gives us his Holy Spirit is because that truly gives us the moral power to overcome our sin. If you're struggling with pornography, you need to get the Holy Spirit in your life to overcome that. If you're struggling with lying, you need to get the Holy Spirit in your life to overcome that. When I was in Jamaica, I served on a mission trip, and I was talking with a guy who literally lived right next to the church. And the Jamaicans, they have a problem. The problem is, is that a lot of them are a bunch of self-righteous, hypocritical people in their own mind. That until you become better, until you become good enough, you're not allowed to enter this church. When I was in the Dominican, the Haitians had to stand outside because they weren't welcomed inside of the church building. 
You want to talk about racism. You want to talk about something that is totally backwards in the kingdom. I mean, how incredibly stupid is it to think that I have got to become good enough before I can go to church? That I've got to become good enough before God will save me. When it's the exact opposite that is true. The only way that you can come to church, the only way that you can come to Jesus and be saved is if you admit that you're not good enough and you need God's Spirit in your life. The only way you can overcome addictions and struggles and pain is to get God's Word and His Holy Spirit involved in your life and that provides the power and the change to be who God wants you to be. We've got to get out of this mindset that before people can come to this church, not saying that we do, but as a, as a Christianity as a whole, we've got to get away from the mindset that we've got to be good enough before we follow Jesus. I want you to think of it like this. That having the Holy Spirit in our life is a lot like fitness, right? Not a step, but it's a journey. Fitness is a journey, not a destination. The moment you stop eating well and stop exercising, you become unfit, the moment you stop reading your word and accessing the Holy Spirit in your life, you become weak, you become unfit for the kingdom. Now we're running out of time, so I want to uh, try to wrap this up. The end in sight, when you have a vision, hill number one is simply this. People living like Jesus. People living like Jesus. That's what God's will is for your life, to be like Jesus to be rescued and healed and saved and to grow and to serve and to pour out your lives for other people. Here's the second hill, right? This is what we're, we're going to end with. The second hill is this. The hill of looking in is our personal walk. The hill of looking out is our local community, finding God's vision for our part of the world. Paul put it like this. You want to talk about a scripture to memorize? This is the scripture to memorize if you want to change people's lives around you. And it goes like this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. Do not share the gospel message without sharing your life. Do not share your life without sharing the gospel message. Verse 7, Paul kind of put it like this. We cared for you like a mother for her own children. Moms, thank you for what you do. Thank you for the care and the nourishment and the patience and the sensitivity that you give for your children because you are modeling. You are exemplifying exactly how we should care for other people in our life. Let your moms serve as an illustration of who God wants you to be with the people that are around you. Every household should hear the gospel in Severn Christian Church. Every child should hear about Jesus. Every marriage should have the understanding of healing and reconciliation in Christ. Every family should be exposed to the truth that Jesus saves. What is the vision for our local community is simply this, that we will not stop until everybody in Severn, Maryland, and our local community hears about Jesus. And we will accomplish that by preaching this morning, by teaching on Wednesdays, by sharing in family life groups, by serving in ministries, by counseling, by having faith-based events in our community, uh, having a give-back week where we're serving people, having fun-based events where we're cooking and we're laughing and we're playing and we're, we're doing sports. Paul put it like this, how should you approach your local community? And 1 Corinthians 9, 9 uh, verse 13, he says this, even though I am free with no master, I have become a slave to bring all people to Christ. He says, when I was with the Jews, I lived like the Jews to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this. Why? So I could bring people to know Jesus. Look what he says in verse 21. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law. However, I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save more. I do everything I can to spread the good news and share in its blessings. And so our, our ending key phrase is simply this, God wants us to share the gospel with our local community through creative platforms without compromising his standards. You know, the people that say they need to walk into a bar and get drunk to win the drunks, it's way off base. We don't need to have uh, sex to win the prostitutes. We don't need to get drunk to win the drunks. We don't need to skip church on Sunday to win those who aren't here, but we should do whatever we can within our creative ability 
to share with people and level with them and share life with them to bring them to know Jesus. What is the end goal for Severn Christian Church? It is a conquered Severn Maryland for the Lord. That's who we want to be and that's what we want to do. Now with all that being said, as I will remind you, our vision presentation is built on the foundation of God's word, but we have taken certain liberties. We have developed a certain strategy to help you grow as a person, as a follower of Jesus, but also to conquer Seven Maryland. And we pray that you will join us. But those things that are liberties, understand they're not the will of the Lord. And God could change whatever he wants to change. And the leadership here wants you to know that we are flexible and open to do whatever it is that God wants us to do. We will think through it. We will plan. But as Proverbs says, the Lord's purposes will prevail. And so here's your key challenge. Your key challenge is simply this. Like I do, I overpack, right? I overpack. I always put too much stuff in. And um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 gives really great encouragement about this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily trips us up or weighs us down. And then as we move forward, as you move forward as a follower of Jesus, you should not be going through life saying, well, what, what are the sins that I need to get rid of to get eternity? But you should be saying, what is slowing me down? What is distracting me? What is preoccupying my time and my ability to serve God and to be a follower of Jesus? Because as hill number one is your personal life and hill number two is the local community, there is a mountaintop experience that I want all of you to be a part of and it's called eternity. That's why we're doing what we do and we cannot forget that our service and our practices and our principles and our Sunday morning preaching and our classes and youth ministries, we cannot forget that all of this is about eternity about going to where God wants us to go. But you cannot get to the mountaintop experience unless you first pass through the river and you get God's spirit in your life. And so this is going to be our song of invitation. I want you to stand and we're going to pray. And if you want to partake of the church here and step out on this journey and walk with us and have the salvation of Jesus Christ, then we're going to sing and invite you to do that now. So please stand and pray with me. God, thank you for Mother's Day, Lord. Thank you for the example that they have set that as we grow personally, Lord, as we share the gospel with our local community, as we connect people together and bring people to Christ, God, I pray that you would be willing to move in us, Lord, that we would focus on your word and we would study and we would seek out your will for our life. God, I know that we don't deserve your grace. God, I know that we don't deserve to live on the mountain with you. But God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to turn back towards you to give us water that does satisfy, to forgive us, Lord, to encourage us and help us. God, I pray that we will be the people that you want us to be, Lord, that we will forever and always look to your word to have our vision, our future, and our lives built upon what you've written for us 2,000 years ago through men who fearlessly lived for you. God, I pray that if there's anyone here who wants to welcome the Holy Spirit in their life, that they will not delay. God, that they will welcome you and repent and be baptized. God, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name.